you know, when I was 15, 16, uh, actually 14, 15, and 16 years old, um, lived in Dunedin, and there were only really two of us as teenagers that were consistently in church at that time in the Dunedin church. That was my good friend Warren Brown that uh, we've, I've stayed in touch with all through these years. He now lives in Brisbane. Um, but I have spoken about this many times to, to many people. There's three or four, maybe five people who've been extremely instrumental in my life, and probably in most cases they don't even know it. And this is one of them. And, and he didn't do anything great. <laughs> all, all that he did, all that he did was took an interest in Warren and me. And all that he did was invite us to come along on those strenuous backpacking trips in the Hollyford Valley. And, but that had a tremendous effect on me. Uh, I seriously doubt that I would have continued as a believer in God without Len and people like him. So I just want to take this opportunity to publicly thank you, Len. I've thought about you um, numerous times through the years and um, have looked forward to the opportunity here today to be here, catch up with you again after all that time and to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your taking an interest in me. And, you know, I notice you've got a bunch of young people here in this church and uh, I'm sure that you as adults are taking an interest that's often all it takes to seal the decision for eternity. Take an interest. Well, I praise the Lord. Um, this was a surprise. <laughs> I, um, I was quite surprised to hear that you'd come back to New Zealand, having spent so long in the States. But we had some good times mm -hmm. back in the Hollywood, didn't we? We sure did. Praise the Lord. I still have those photographs. I think uh, you looked a little younger then. I think I did too. <laughs> Pastor for Spiritual Growth Ministries. It's a field role in this conference. Just so glad to be here. And it is a miracle. We don't have time to, to speak about that today, but we're all a miracle, really, aren't we? It's a miracle that I'm in Seventh-day Adventist ministry today and that I'm back here in New Zealand ministering for the gospel. I just give all praise to God for that. And thanks for you, Lynn. Appreciate you too. No worries. But we want to welcome your, your wife, Betty, here as well. And I'm sure over lunch we'll find out what has happened in these intervening years. Anyway, a big welcome to both of you. I guess some are voting for Labour, and some are voting for National, and some are voting for Maori, and some are voting for ACT, and some are voting for New Zealand First, and I think there's a few more that I forgot. I vote for Jesus. How about you? That's my vote. His rulership ultimately is the only rulership that counts. Are you with me on that? And politicians can come and politicians can go, but Jesus goes on forever. And if you and I want to go on forever, we go with Jesus. Let's vote for Him every day we live. About a year ago, I was visiting a church in Colorado, a church actually about this size, perhaps a little smaller. And I was sitting in Sabbath school. I was sitting, I think, about that row there, equivalent, listening in the Sabbath school. I couldn't help but notice that there was an, um, a gentleman sitting just in front of me, just to the side here. I, I could just barely see his face, but. You know how when you look at people sometimes you can sense a tremendous weight attached to them? You haven't said a word to them, they haven't said a word to you, but you just sense that weight, that burden. And that's what I sensed with this man. He was sitting all alone, right up front, with a tremendously sad look on his face. The weight of the shoulders was on, uh, the weight of the world was on that man's shoulders. I started praying for him. And the more we went through Sabbath school, the more I prayed for him, because unlike the Sabbath school, which I enjoyed this morning, 
that particular Sabbath school was filled with misery. They were talking about the coming of Jesus and the end of the world, but there was no joy in it. Oh, how terrible the world is. Oh, how miserable we all are as Christians. Oh, how we're failing in our work. Oh, how the prophecies of doom and gloom are coming upon us. Oh, how terrible the time of trouble is going to be and few of us will survive. That was the entire discussion through that combined Sabbath school lesson. And here is this man with his shoulders going lower and lower and lower. I tell you, friends, the message of Jesus is a message of hope. Do you agree? And if we're not sharing hope, we're not sharing the message of Jesus. And it's possible to tell the truth in such a way that it ends up being a lie. So I prayed for this man. And I was there to preach that day. I had, I think, what was a, a reasonable message lined up to preach, but suddenly it hit me about five minutes before that lesson study ended. It hit me that I could not preach what I had planned to preach. Something different was needed. I thought that I needed to speak as vehemently as I could about the everlasting gospel, about the good news of righteousness through Jesus Christ and the full, complete atonement that Jesus accomplished for us and how we may move from this place of sin to that place of righteousness, holiness in Christ and the full assurance of eternal life so that we may go to our judgment with joy And I thought, now what can I preach that I have not prepared for? And the only place I could think to go was John chapter 5. And I want to share, share here this morning that same message that I shared in that church in Colorado. I love the ministry of Jesus, don't you? It's phenomenal what he did in just three years of walking around Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. What he accomplished in just three years is amazing. Three years for me just goes by like that. And I look back and say, what have I done? What have I accomplished? It seems like nothing. But in three years, Jesus saved the world. Every contact Jesus had was a contact for eternity. And one day, Jesus wandered into a, an area that was known as the Pool of Bethesda. It was a sad place, a place of extreme misery. And he went in. Here he is, the life giver, the healer. And he walks into a place of sadness, sickness, misery, and death. They're pulling out people every day from that area who have died and who have lived a good portion of their lives right in that place. And one particular case catches his eye. It is probably the saddest case that the Pool of Bethesda had ever seen. It is a man who is as good as dead and has been as good as dead for 38 years. We don't know what took place in his life that led to his illness, but we suspect from something Jesus said later, that there was some manner of living, some kind of sinful experience in that man's life that had contributed to his situation. So there he is, lying there on a stinking mat, probably the same mat he came in with. A mat that certainly was not getting washed and cleaned. A mat probably that was crawling with bugs. And there he is, lying, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, 
decade after decade. He's been there nearly four decades. Can you imagine that? Some of you who've been sick for a month. The month seemed like a year. But this man had been on that mat, unable to move without aid, for 38 years. It was a sad and miserable situation. But Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the light of life, Jesus, the resurrection, Jesus, the Lord of heaven, walked up to that man. And I believe that he didn't stay standing. I believe he knelt down because it's the character of Jesus to get right down to your level and to mine. I love that about Jesus. And kneeling by that man, he no doubt reached out and touched him because that, again, was the manner of Jesus, to reach out and touch, to touch the untouchables. He no doubt asked his name. We know that he engaged him in conversation. And Jesus asked a question which might seem surprising. He said, do you want to be healed? <laughs> I think the answer would be pretty obvious, don't you? But this is what Jesus does. He engages us. He does nothing without our permission. Do you want to be healed? The man replied, I'd love to be healed. Every day I long for healing, but I'm all alone. There's no one to help me. Years ago, I had some family members who took an interest, but I haven't seen them for a long time. Someone else gets into the pool ahead of me every time. I'm helpless. Can you help me? What's the answer to that question? You better believe it. The helper of all was standing there beside him, kneeling beside him. And Jesus did not beat around the bush. He didn't say, well, let me pull out my little script that I have to read. Jesus simply declared to that man right there, lying paralyzed by the pool, get up, take up your mat, and go on home. I love the brevity and the directness of Jesus, don't you? He comes right to the point. He comes exactly to the condition in which you find yourself. Now I suspect that there are some of us here this morning who are paralyzed. And the reason I can say that is because I have experienced paralysis in my own life. Now I've experienced physical paralysis only once as a result of an accident. The whole left side of my face was paralyzed for about three months, that was not pleasant. Praise God for healing on that, and it was His healing. But I know that I've been paralyzed in more important ways. I have sometimes been paralyzed in my heart, and my soul, and my mind, and my emotions. There are times when I have felt completely powerless to act and live as a Christian man. Addictions in our lives can paralyze us. You know that, and I know that. Resentment, anger in our lives can paralyze us. You know that, and I know that. Jealousy, envy, things like pornography can paralyze us in our lives. You know that, and I know that. My friends, if I'm not mistaken, all of us here, have at some stage of our lives experienced some kind of spiritual and emotional and mental paralysis. A paralyzed person cannot get up and walk. But Jesus came up to this man and said, get up and walk. <sighs> when Jesus gives an order, it is an order that carries with it tremendous power, the power of heaven itself. When Jesus came up to demon-possessed people and said, get out of him, there was power in that. Jesus did not say to those demon-possessed people, excuse me, but if it's not too much problem, could you like give him a break? <laughs> Jesus simply said, get out. 
And Jesus did not have to plead with the devil. In his own power, he said to that man, get up and walk. And the man got up and he walked. Now it's interesting that Jesus also added this little line. He said, get up, take up your mat and walk. I've often wondered why Jesus said for the man to take up his mat. That mat was stinking. That mat would have been better left behind. But Jesus said, take it up and walk. I have to wonder if Jesus was not here giving an illustration of the reality of life. When Jesus speaks life into your life and mine, it is an amazing miracle. We are transformed. We would never want to go back to where we were before. There is a joy and a hope and a health that comes into us that is amazing. And yet we know that in ourselves, as we looked at in the lesson I joined in this morning, in Romans chapter 7, there is still something kind of stinky about us. Isn't there? Please say yes. I don't want to be alone on this. There's still something stinky about you and I. And that stinkiness, my friends, will not be removed until this mortal puts on immortality. This corruptible puts on incorruption. We are looking forward to a great resurrection when all stinkiness will be left behind, when the mat will finally disappear. Doesn't Paul say somewhere, I'm always carrying around this stinkiness? But we may take that up once the mat carried the man, but now the man carries the mat. Once your sins may have carried you, your addictions may have carried you, but now, by God's grace, you may carry them. It's a transformation. There are people all around us in society, in our communities, who are bound to a mat, who are bound to something that symbolizes their complete inability to function in a proper spiritual manner. But I believe Jesus Christ today can come to those people and say, Rise, take up your mat, and walk we may still be transformed by God's grace. Do you believe that today? We are not left to be paralyzed for the rest of our lives. We are not left to be always in stinkiness and sin. The same Jesus who walked to that man that day and said, Rise, take up your mat and walk, can come to you, my friend, wherever you are today, and say, Rise, take up your mat and walk. Now, typically in Jesus' ministry, he would perform a miracle and then give a teaching. And it's always fascinating to look at the link between the miracle and the teaching. And so after Jesus had performed this miracle, he did give some teaching. John 5, 21, for example, we read that in our scripture reading. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears, I'm sorry, let me go to verse 21 first. That was verse 24. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. I love that. That man by the pool was as good as dead, but the resurrection and the life walked into his life. And he was raised from the dead. He walked. And for the first time in 38 years, that man had the blessing of a regular, normal life. But then I love what Jesus said just a few verses later in verse 24. In fact, if you would ask me what my favorite text in the entire Bible is, it is this verse, John 5 and verse 24. If anyone, said Jesus, hears my word and believes him who sent me, that one 
has everlasting life. He will not come into condemnation, but has already passed from death to life. Do you hear that? Does that make an impact on your life? Does John 5.24 mean something to you this very Sabbath morning? Let's think about it again. Jesus said, if anyone, what does that mean? I think it means anyone, right? No matter what race you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter what experience you have religiously, no matter if you're healthy or well, young or old, if anyone, no matter if you have been steeped in sin and paralyzed by sin for 38 years, if anyone does two things, very simple things, Jesus did not say, if anyone begins from this day forward to keep my commandments perfectly. He did not say, if anyone will diligently try to do his very best from now on for the rest of his days. Jesus did not say, if anyone will diligently put aside all sin and scrub his life clean, get himself all fresh and perfect. Jesus said, if anyone does two things, number one, what was it? Here's my word. It's pretty simple, isn't it? To hear, you have to listen. Are you hearing the word of the Lord for your life today? Are you reading the word of the Lord for your life today? With all of the things around us that command our attention through television, through billboards, through radio, through movies, through video games, through whatever, are you hearing God's voice today speaking to you personally? It's something that each of us can do. God's Spirit provides for us to do that. And if you have not been listening to and hearing the word of the Lord today, I encourage you to do that right now. So, number one, if anyone hears my word. Number two, what was it? And believes him who sent me. You see, it is not simply a matter of hearing the word and understanding the word it is a step further and an important step it is the step of saying Lord Jesus not only do I hear what you are saying to me about eternal life and resurrection and sin and holiness not only do I hear that but I want to stake my life on that I don't want my life staked anymore on what I've learned in the educational systems of the world I don't want my life anymore staked on what I see on TV or in movies. I want my life from this point on to be established on the Word of the Lord. It's a radical difference. Faith, forsaking all I take Him. A little acronym for faith. Say it with me. Forsaking all I take him. Once more, I didn't hear it loudly enough. Forsaking all I take him. It's very simple. It's very direct. Forsaking all. In other words, leaving aside the stupidity of Hollywood and all of that stuff out there. Forsaking all I take him. That is the step of faith. The step of not only hearing the word of the Lord, but putting your life on the basis of the word of the Lord. There are so many voices out there today, my friend. I hope you are hearing the voice of the Lord. 
I hope that you are making time in your life and giving attention to that word which comes from heaven because that's the word that will save your life for eternity. If anyone hears my word, and believes him who sent me, believes that there is still a creator God. I know 95% of the people out there, at least in this land, don't believe in the creator God. But my friend, you may, you can, and you will, because you are hearing the word of the Lord. Don't let anybody out there convince you that it is stupid and ridiculous to believe in the creator God. My friends, your destiny hangs on that belief. Take away that belief and nothing is left and life becomes nothing. If anyone hears my word and believes him who sent me, what then? According to Jesus in John 5, 24, what then? That person has what? everlasting life. My friends, it is in the present tense. It does not say that if anyone hears my word and believes him who sent me, that person, if he's holy enough, if he's good enough, if he's persistent enough, if he's obedient enough, and if God is in a good mood, when it's all said and done, maybe, just maybe, that person might make it into heaven. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus was definitive. We waffle on this subject, but Jesus was definitive on this subject. He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God has not life. There is only one final determinant of whether you are saved and whether you are lost, and that is the simple question, do you have the Son of God in your life? Are you committed to Him? Are you following Him? Have you heard his word? Do you believe the Father who sent the Son? Do you believe that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners? Do you know that you are, yourself are a sinner? And have you committed yourself with all of your sin to Jesus Christ? That, my friend, is what cuts the chase between those who are lost and those who are saved. If you hear my word, and believe the Father who sent me, you have, present tense, eternal life. You have it. So that even if you were to die at some time in the future before Christ returns, it's simply a sleep. The eternal life of God is already within you, and that life will go on, and you will be resurrected to join in that life once again. Is that something you believe this morning, my friends? This was a stunning teaching. It was most unlike what the church of the time was attempting to teach. Completely different from that. The church of the time was teaching that in order to be sure of heaven, you had to make sure that your actual behavior was pretty well 100%. Oh, 99% might also do, but nothing less. But Jesus marched onto the scene of human history and said that while he longs for good behavior, wants holiness with all his heavenly power, the basis on which our salvation is secure is His righteousness, His holiness. We are, in fact, saved by obedience, but it is the obedience of Jesus that saves us. Because your obedience and my obedience, friends, will always fall short. I don't care how holy you become. Your holiness will never measure up to the perfect standard of heaven. Only one person has lived up to that standard, and that is Jesus Christ, our Savior. If anyone hears my word and believes him who sent me, that person has everlasting life. And Jesus knew that this would be very hard to accept, so he went on to say, just so they knew for sure, he went on to say, that person 
who now has everlasting life will not come into condemnation. Will not. Jesus said it. You can count on it. The Apostle Paul picked up the refrain in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 when he said, There is therefore now, finish it for me, no condemnation to those who? Who are in Christ Jesus. You see, this, my friends, is the secret. The reason that I can march onto my judgment with joy is because I'm going to my judgment in Christ. If I am in Christ, I can no more be excluded from heaven than Christ himself can be excluded from heaven. In Christ. In Christ. I have eternal life. Three things Jesus said, actually. Number one, that person has everlasting life. Number two, that person will not come into condemnation. And number three, that person has already passed from death to life. Already passed from death to life. Is this not a great joy for you this morning? To know that while you do, out of a heart filled with love for Jesus, while you do strive for holiness, while you do long for more obedience in your life, that is always the response we have to Jesus, if it's genuine. You know that your assurance of salvation is fixed firmly on Jesus Christ and His Word. And if you ever doubt that for a moment, think of that paralyzed man. Once he was dead, now he's alive. He has walked on home with his mat. And as you know, the church of the time tried to kick up a stink. You'd think the church of the time would have had an enormous celebration, a big party in Jerusalem that day, because one who had been sick for 38 years was healed. But you know what they were doing? They were arguing over the fact that Jesus healed the man on a Sabbath and therefore was a Sabbath breaker. Can you see where their minds were? And they set out all the more to ensure that Jesus was put out of the way, that he was killed. Can you see where their minds were? Where is your mind today, my friend? Where is your mind? Are you seeing Jesus Christ lifted up for you on a cross? Are you seeing His blood-stained, tear-stained face? Are you seeing His arms stretched out wide for you, saying, Come, all you who labor and are weary laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you eternal life. I am delighted that right now, through faith, each of us might know and understand that our salvation is secure. Is this something you believe in the Fongare Church? If we miss out on that, my friends, we miss out on everything. We do not want a church that repeats the mistake of the church of old, do we? We want a church that is firmly founded on this understanding that the everlasting gospel is among us. It is the everlasting good news, not bad news. Good news. That we are safe and secure in Jesus our Lord. Two stories to close. I was pastoring in a church in, uh, in Colorado, not that same one I mentioned earlier. And um, it was a fairly large church. There was a man there who was a leader in the church, an older gentleman. And he was very unhappy, actually, with some of the changes that were taking place in the church. He'd grown up in that church, gotten to the place in his life where things were changing in a way that unsettled him enormously. And he used to call us as pastors there frequently. A fine man, but he really was very upset about things. And the, the best that we could do was simply sit there and listen. We tried to listen to him. 
to pray with him, but he seemed a very unhappy man. And one day he called the church, and I was in the church office, and I answered the phone. He said, Ed, he said, I really need to talk with you. And I said, okay. He said, when can you talk with me? So we set a time, a few days on. So I was there in my office upstairs, and he came on up. And I had prayed ahead of time and said, Lord, you know, just help me to be patient. Help me to listen. Help me to honor him as one of your kids. As soon as he came in, he sat down and he started to cry. Now that got my attention. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? And he said, Ed, he said, I have grown up in this church. I have been a member of this church all my life. I am now 79 years old and I've been sick. And I don't know how long I have to live. And when I think about the judgment, and when I think about the coming of Christ, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I'm going to make it. Can you help me? And I shared with that man the message I have just shared with you from John 5 and verse 24. And you could see him relax. And you could see him with joy in his mind. And at the end of that conversation, I prayed with him. This is a 79-year-old man, a leader in the church, who's grown up in the church, who never understood the simple truth that in Christ there is life. In Christ there is freedom from condemnation. In Christ there is assurance of eternity. But I praise God that by the Holy Spirit, the message began to get through that very morning when I was talking with him. And at the end of that, he stood up, gave me a big hug, and he said, Ed, I love you. I really think what he was saying was, Ed, finally now, I love Jesus Christ, and I understand the love of Jesus Christ for me. Now, I left you with the man sitting on the front pew, and I know that you would not be able to eat your lunch today without knowing about that man. And I have to say, all glory to God. But as I shared that message of everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ, I saw something I never thought I'd see on that man's face. Guess what it was? A smile. And the smile began about a quarter of the way in, and the smile by the halfway through was pretty big, and by the time we finished, the smile was this wide. And his shoulders were no longer slumped. And I thought, like high-fiving God, yes, yes, Lord, your word has found its mark. Once again, Jesus has walked on earth through a humble instrument of clay. He has shared his word. He has shared everlasting life, and his soul has responded. And no sooner had we finished that message than that man made a beeline for me. He came right up to me and he said with a big smile, he said, Brother Ed, he said, I am that paralyzed man. I found out later that there were many troubles in his life. He was going through a divorce and he just lost his job and had some health issues. I am that man. He explained to me that earlier in the week, out of his distress, he had opened his Bible and he had been reading about the man by the pool. And he had concluded that this was himself. And he said, earlier this week, I prayed to God and I said, God, will you please send someone to lift me up? I need to be lifted up. I need to walk. Will you please, God, send someone to lift me up so that I might walk? He said, that was my prayer earlier this week. And this morning, he said, my prayer has been answered. And I give all praise and all glory to God. I don't know what's taking place in your life right now. But I invite any of you here who might be in any respect paralyzed through sin, through a broken relationship, through disappointment and discouragement, or through disease, or through confusion 
about the way of life. I encourage any of you who might be in any respect paralyzed this morning to hear the voice of Jesus, to hear Christ walk by your side and say, Arise, take up your mat, and walk. That's it. God bless each of you.